Hey YouTube, it's Tyra the Antenna Man. Today I'm going to talk about my visit to the ATSC 3.0 testing lab at One Media, along with an independent test that I'll be showing you of a live ATSC 3.0 broadcast compared side to side with a live ATSC 1.0 broadcast. First, I would like to thank Marshall Bierman of One Media LLC for the invitation to visit this ATSC 3.0 testing lab right outside of Baltimore, Maryland, the opportunity to learn so much more about this new standard. I also want to thank Ralph Bachnofen of Triveni Digital for loaning me the ATSC 3.0 dongle to show you guys a live ATSC 3.0 broadcast, which you'll see a little bit later in this video. If you're interested in learning more about some of the dongles currently available to pick up these select few experimental ATSC 3.0 TV broadcasts, you can find them at ATSC3Verifier.com. As some of you may have seen, I produced a video a few weeks ago on ATSC 3.0. It's a new television standard that's being worked on and is set to replace the current ATSC 1.0 standard over the next decade. Some of the features include 4K video, on-demand content, and improved reception, just to name a few. If you want to learn a little bit more about the background of ATSC 3.0, I attached a video in the link of this description. Before I show you some live ATSC 3.0 broadcasts, I want to tell you about my visit with One Media. The engineers there provided me with some excellent information about ATSC 3.0, so much information that I wasn't aware of. The possibilities of this new standard is completely unbelievable, and it's just there's so much to it that I cannot condense in one video. I was able to ask them some questions about their approach with ATSC 3.0. One of the questions I asked is, will ATSC 3.0 enable better reception than the current fragile ATSC 1.0 broadcasts? In many cases, yes. The reason being is that the current ATSC 1.0 system is very fragile and multipath interference is an issue. So for those of you that have planes that go by, cars that go by, lots of trees around, you'll notice uh, signal disruptions pretty easily. The new standard is IP based, which means multipath isn't a problem. And in some cases, may even help with reception. I'll be demonstrating this a little bit later in my video with my test. Another question I asked is how many subchannels does ATSC 3.0 support and will some of the current subchannels disappear as a result of the conversion? In terms of some of the channels disappearing, it's very unlikely for two main reasons. The first reason is that subchannels, every subchannel on a TV channel, brings in significant ad revenue to the TV station, advertising dollars. And if a subchannel disappears, so does the advertising dollars, and no TV station wants that. The other reason why some subchannels are unlikely to go away with ATSC 3.0 is a new highly efficient encoding method with ATSC 3.0 that allows the potential for up to 16 live TV broadcasts on a single frequency. That's 16 compared to the average four or five on the current spectrum. This is a quick shot of ATSC 3.0 running a loop of a Comet program at 1.5 megabits per second, which is very low. Yet the picture quality looks pretty good for this standard definition TV broadcast. Most main TV channels are in the 7 to 9 megabits range, but this is only 1.5. Yet it still looks very good. The same goes for this HD broadcast running at about 4 megabits per second. The quality looks just as good as a main dot one channel running at about 8 megabits per second. This advanced encoding method allows TV stations to potentially use half of the bandwidth that they're currently using to host their main station all the sub channels while not sacrificing picture quality. Another question I asked was about the encryption in ATSC 3.0 and that it has the potential for broadcasters to require some kind of subscription or monthly fee to access their broadcasts. How true is this and will it kill over the air TV as we know it? I was told that the FCC requires the main dot one channel to be open to the public without any encryption. So the main ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox station is not going to have any encryption, is not going to require subscription. But some of you are probably saying, oh, what about the sub channels? The sub channels aren't a part of the dot one. So they have the potential to ask for a subscription for me TV, antenna TV, court TV, all those sub channels. There goes over the air TV as we know it. 
This is unlikely to happen for the reason I mentioned earlier. Subchannels bring in a decent amount of ad revenue to the TV stations, and that is based off ratings. So if a TV station restricts one of their subchannels, the ratings drop completely, the ad revenue drops completely, they piss off the advertisers, they piss off the viewers, and it's just not a good situation. I don't think any broadcaster is going to do that. So don't worry, your Me TV, Antenna TV, Comet TV is not going anywhere. One way we may see encryption used on over-the-air TV in ATSC 3.0 is the example of ABC. It's owned by the Disney Network, which also owns ESPN. Since ATSC 3.0 is more efficient, they can fit more channels in there. So you'll see the same ABC and sub-channels on your local ABC station, but you might also see ESPN available for a subscription. This may sound crazy, but this is actually a good thing because for those of you that want ESPN or certain other networks, you have no choice but to subscribe to cable, satellite, or certain over-the-top services like Sling TV and YouTube TV, requiring you to get a lot of channels you don't watch. Well, if you have the option to just buy one, a lot of you have been asking about a la carte, here it is. So again, free TV is not going away, but encryption may be used in this situation. There were several other questions that I asked, which I will talk about in a future video of mine, but I want to get back to the point of the ATSC 3.0 broadcast and the test that I conducted right outside Baltimore. Let me tell you the day didn't go exactly as planned. So around two o'clock, I was done at the lab. I had the dongle, I had the software, pretty much everything was set to go for me to start receiving these broadcasts on my laptop. I go to a Wendy's parking lot and start checking to see if I could pick up the signal and I'm not getting any. Thing. So I move a little bit closer to the broadcast tower. I think this was like a Burger King parking lot. I'm still not getting anything. So I move closer and then closer again to the point that I was two miles from the broadcast tower, still not getting the signal. At this point, I came to the conclusion that there's definitely something wrong with my software because I wasn't getting any kind of picture or a signal to noise ratio, no matter where I was, even two miles from the broadcast tower. So I stopped in at a local Starbucks, uninstalled the software, reinstalled it. That didn't work. So I contact Marshall from One Media and tell him I'm having issues with the software. He had left the lab for the day. Mind you, it's a Friday at around 4.30. I tell Marshall, hey, listen, the workday's over. If you already left the lab, no big deal. I'll figure this out with Ralph and you know get it working possibly tomorrow but he insists that I meet him back at the lab so he goes back to lab after hours and sets me up with the software to make sure that I can do the test and start experiencing ATSC 3.0 that night so I really appreciate that Marshall for going above and beyond and giving these viewers something to see at this point it's about 5 15 in the evening it's dark it's rainy it's foggy but at least I have the software working and I can finally see these ATSC 3.0 broadcast on my own time and start driving around seeing how it works. I go back to the local Wendy's that I originally started out at about three hours prior to charge my laptop since the battery was starting to run a little bit low. Inside the Wendy's, there's not an outlet in sight for me to charge my laptop. And at this point, I had spent three and a half hours running around. I really just wanted to do the test because I had a long day. I drove two and a half hours to Baltimore. So I went back to my car and set up the antennas and got ready to do it. I go to reach for the dongle, which I thought was in my laptop bag, and it's not in my laptop bag. Uh, no big deal, maybe it's in my camera bag. It's not in my camera bag. Okay, maybe it's in the back seat. It's not in the back seat. Maybe it's under the seats. It's not under the seat. Mind you that this is a thousand dollar dongle that was loaned to me by Ralph of Triveni Digital. I keep searching my car, don't find it. I go back inside the Wendy's. Maybe it fell out of my bag inside the Wendy's. No one turned it in. Is it possible that it fell out of my bag in the parking lot of One Media? I say, there's no way I'm gonna find it because it's dark outside now, it's raining, and it's possible a car ran over it. So I'm kind of like freaking out, trashing my car. Mind you, there's a whole bunch of antenna stuff in it from a prior install that I did earlier this week. I'm just looking everywhere and just saying, why is this dongle nowhere to be found? After about 45 minutes, the dongle eventually showed up in my car. It was under my seat and somehow I missed it the two or three times that I was looking underneath the seats and it must have just been at a bad angle that I didn't catch it. So I finally have everything I need to run this test. I set my portable ATSC 1.0 tuner to comment on WNVU, which broadcasts at 750 kilowatts ERP on RF channel 25. 
The experimental ATSC 3.0 station is broadcasting at a lower power and higher frequency, which means that it probably isn't going to have as good coverage as the old 1.0 signal. My test was about 10 miles from the broadcast towers, and just as a heads up, the experimental ATSC 3.0 station is showing more of a looping program rather than the same live broadcast that you may see on the portable tuner to the right of the laptop. Immediately I noticed I had no trouble getting the ATSC 3.0 signal in the parking lot and as I start to drive. The 1.0 tuner doesn't even produce a picture fixed and while driving. Until I get to an intersection you'll see it start to decode a little bit here. The whole time while I'm driving, the ATSC 3.0 signal stays solid and does not drop out despite being at a lower power and higher frequency. My laptop battery gets low, so I stop in at a Five Guys to charge my laptop and compare both broadcasts inside. This is a software that I used. As you can see, it shows two live broadcasts and a quick thumbnail preview and some other information. I am able to show the live broadcast feed by opening up VLC Media Player, but unfortunately my laptop's graphics card couldn't keep up with both the live broadcast and the screen capture at the same time. So the choppiness you see in the video is actually not there. For this reason, I decided to film this portion with my cell phone camera. The 3.0 broadcast had no problem being picked up by the little antenna, but the 1.0 broadcasts were cutting in and out, especially as I moved the antenna around. This demonstration on top of the car demonstration shows how robust the ATSC 3.0 signal is compared to the ATSC 1.0, especially with multipath. The multipath you're seeing when it pixelates and everything, when an airplane goes by, when a car goes by your house, when the trees blow in the wind, that's pretty much eliminated altogether with the new ATSC 3.0 standard. And you saw that as the car was moving and as the antenna was moving inside Five Guys. Some some of you may be saying, okay Tyler, I see that the signal is definitely more robust, but why don't you do a test in a rural environment, like 60, 70 miles from the broadcast towers, to see how the new standard is going to work for people in the rural area. Unfortunately, I can't reliably test this out for two main reasons. The first reason is that this experimental station is operating at a special temporary authority by the FCC and at a reduced power compared to the other stations in the market. So it it wouldn't be accurate if I went 70 miles from the broadcast towers and say, oh, it's not coming in. If you're 70 miles from the broadcast towers, you're not going to get it. The second is there are still some things being figured out on the transmission side of the broadcast. Now, ATSC 3.0 is not like ATSC 1.0. 1.0 was just pretty much a standard linear signal. There's just one signal going out. It's divided up, you know, based on the subchannels. But ATSC 3.0 has so many more variables that are being worked on. One of the engineers compared it to having 40 knobs at the transmitter site. Again, this was an experimental station that I showed, but I'm sure you all can agree with me that the new signal is a lot more robust than the current ATSC 1.0 signal that's very fragile and pixelates every time something small moves, and that can only help reception in rural areas. Now there was a lot to my video, but what I got out from my visit and testing with One Media is that their vision of ATSC 3.0 is a much more robust signal that can be easily picked up with smaller antennas, even that junk antenna I make fun of in all my videos. That may be able to pick up the 3.0 broadcast with no problem. On top of that, there are a lot of other possibilities that are still yet to be determined. One Media is just one of several ATSC 3.0 labs running experiments and figuring out ways to perfect and utilize this new technology. In the coming weeks, I will be visiting other ATSC 3.0 labs to give you guys some good insight on what's going on behind the scenes on the future of free over-the-air TV. This technology truly is incredible. I did learn a lot yesterday um, in terms of all the possibilities and how it works, but that's just a small piece to the puzzle of what is ATSC 3.0, especially because there are so many other labs doing different experiments and may have a different approach to the technology. Thanks again to Marshall from One Media for the opportunity to visit the lab and learn so much more about this new standard, things that I have yet to tell you all about. Thanks to Ralph from Triventi Digital for the USB dongle, which gave me the opportunity to test Baltimore's signal. And thank you for watching. Have an awesome day.